Good evening, folks. It's Diamond with the Oppenheimer Ranch Project and Magnetic Reversal News, bringing you a magnetic excursion update Thursday, July 25th, around 8 p.m. Mountain Time, 2024. A rogue CME made a passage earlier today, and we have more CMEs on the way. Potential impact on the 27th. We're also watching Kilauea. Upper East Rift Zone intrusion is ongoing and seismicity has been increasing. Plus, a fire, the Jasper Fire, fast-moving wildfire, hits Canadian resort town. Keep calm. It's boom time. Now, I wish I could have got this in here in the opening, but it is the main story. Sunday was the hottest day ever recorded on Earth. That's the claim the average global temperature reached 17.09 degrees C or 62.76 Fahrenheit, which is just above the record set last July. The only problem is it's all made up. Let me break it down for you. On July 21st, 2024, the European Union's Copernicus Climate Change Service declared it the hottest day ever citing a global average surface temperature of 62.76 degrees. These claims have sparked skepticism and frustration. One of the major point of contention is the concept of global temperature, which some argue is a statistical construct rather than a physical reality. For starters, it's suggested that using the average global temperature to represent climate conditions oversimplifies complex and varied local weather patterns. That's A. B is the fact that the methodology used by Copernicus has come under scrutiny for years. The reported temperatures are not actual temperatures. Let me repeat that. The actual hottest temperature ever recorded is not an actual temperature. It's based on models and computer simulations rather than direct measurements, both of which are subject to accuracy and reliability issues, as well as making shit up. In contrast, a global network of surface temperature stations provides real-time data on the same day, and these stations recorded an average temperature of 58 Fahrenheit, which is 4.76F cooler than the climate alarmists' fake models. Those are the facts. You want more facts? Texas broke all-time daily records this week. Multiple records falling in Texas. The blue dots this week are record cold temps in the center of the U.S., none of which was reported on by the mainstream media. And not only that, you're looking at just the last 65 million years on Earth. The last few hundred thousand years is the coldest Earth has ever been, ever, by 15 degrees C in just the last 60 million. It's not the hottest day, nothing, not the hottest day, anything. It is the coldest time on, in Earth's entire geologic history. That's the time we're living. And the entire population has been duped into the idea that somehow it's warming catastrophically on Earth when all of the other geologic time, all of it, for all of eternity, hundreds of millions of years, for the most part, except some small blips maybe in the Permian, have been warmer than today. And they really need to get up to speed on actual science. Florida thunderstorm zaps a tree with brilliant lightning strike. As lightning bolts increase, the footage increases as well. And this is one of the reasons, folks, why you don't stand under a tree during a thunderstorm. Absolutely the worst place you could be, as you can see here. Facts don't lie, and lightning kills. Holy macaroni. Firefighters try to save Jasper as fast-moving wildfires hit a Canadian resort town. Thousands of residents and tourists have already evacuated, and federal support has been offered to Alberta. 
In fact, military resources have been brought in to tackle the fire after bucketing efforts by helicopters failed and water bombers were unable to help due to dangerous flying conditions. I just heard before the breaking news and tonight's update that four countries have sent firefighters over here to Canada, including Australia and, well, many other regions, which I currently don't remember. But the Jasper fire has forced more than 25,000 people to flee the Canadian resort town. And it doesn't look good. There are no words. Jasper has been burned to the ground. Let's take a look. Okay, this is up with the, with the gas. We may need one or two. So I, when, once I know, I'll, I'll let you know. Good. Good. Okay, thanks, Blake. What about the Nodwell berm? The Nodwell goes down to the petrol can and just wait for there. Alright, I'm on my way. Yeah, that, uh, there's another water truck parked there, I think. There's mom and dad's house. I'm stepping away from the radio for about five minutes. Clearly, we can see a devastating fire, not a total loss. We did see structures in the background here that have that are safe. Let me move it through there in the background. Clearly see that some houses and vehicles are fine, but there has been some devastating losses in Jasper. Nonetheless, our hearts, thoughts, and prayers go out to them and those that are affected. Guys, if you could do us a favor, join us over at X at Oppenheimer Ranch Project at Diamond the Dave. That's Oppenheimer Ranch Project at Diamond the Dave, where you get all of the breaking news 24 hours a day, unlike the channel, which just does one upload per day. So go get it. Here is the full forecast. Heavy rainfall threat along the Texas and Louisiana coast. Excessive heat in the northern plains. A warm tropical air mass along the western and central Gulf Coast continues to bring a threat of heavy and excessive rainfall for the middle and upper Texas coast and southwestern Louisiana through the night. Rounds of heavy rainfall will likely lead to flash flooding concerns. Another day of hot temperatures is in store for the northern high plains as well. Maximum temperatures may reach or exceed 100 degrees. After all, it's summer, and that's not a bummer. Quick look at the GFS model, moving through three hours. We could see some excessive pop-up storms there uh, on the East Coast, northern Florida, as well as Georgia. That's going to rapidly move offshore by midnight. And by tomorrow, we're going to have some moderate rain in the southeast, nothing significant. And the good news is we're going to have a nice pattern setting up here in the four corners for some pop-up storms. Uh, overall, nothing significant as far as severe weather as we move to the end of July and into August. Uh, the August pattern for the Four Corners looks like heavy monsoon uh, for the desert southwest, which is good news for areas like Tucson, which will be inundated with rain in the beginning of August, maybe extending throughout the entire rest of the summer. Not a bummer. We like precipitation in the desert. Let's take a quick look at the uh, total accumulated precipitation and move it through here through the end of the month. This is through the end of July. Big winter chicken dinner southeast picking up at least four to five inches in many of the states, including northern Florida, southern Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, and east Texas on the coast. So good news for those regions with heavy rain. Tweaking it out for the central U.S. and the Upper Plains and the Ohio Valley and all that look at the moisture coming to your neck of the woods and good news just like I suggested the end of August is going to bring heavy monsoon moving up into the four corners which is setting us up for really good rain totals for the end of the summer could be six seven inches for our location we just got two inches all summer last year if we get eight this year oh we're going to be having a banner crop of summer and winter squash the problem is the dry hole. This is all the way through mid-August, and there is almost no precipitation for areas where heavy wildfires are now inundating the region. 
a quick look over here at the fire and smoke map and you can see where that huge pocket of smoke we were inundated for the last three days here in the four corners looks like it's easing up today thank god we're in this smoke free zone but many of the upper 58 in heavy haze and smoke from all these fires in the pacific northwest as well as canada None of the Pacific Northwest fires look like they're going to get quelched by natural causes anytime soon. We just looked at that precipitation map. So unfortunately, these fires will continue to burn as many of the other fires get put out by natural causes. Uh, good news for us, we can breathe kind of freely here as opposed to the Pacific Northwest and the Central U.S., which are under heavy haze and dangerous air quality conditions. Our prayers go out to all of you suffering from what is simply natural. <laughs> Seismic update, no quakes of note. Uptick in Hawaii continues, and we'll get to that. Interesting rumbler here at the end of the Caribbean Fault, 5.0 in Venezuela earlier today. Up at the surface, I'm sure many people felt the rumbling as we take a quick move over to Worldwide Volcano News. We've got a quick update for you on the Biscuit Basin hydrothermal explosion over at Yellowstone. It's official. Here is the official uh, July 23rd Biscuit Basin update from yesterday. The National Park Service field crews have completed the preliminary assessment of conditions following the hydrothermal explosion at Black Diamond Pool. The July 23, 2024 hydrothermal explosion at Biscuit Basin resulted from water suddenly transitioning to steam in the shallow hydrothermal system beneath Black Diamond Pool and was not caused by any volcanic activity whatsoever. Seismicity and ground deformation and gas and thermal emissions remain at their normal background levels for the entire park, and there was no detectable precursors to this hydrothermal event. The explosion, which sent ash and steam and debris to a height of hundreds of feet above the ground, destroyed a nearby boardwalk and ejected grapefruit-sized rocks tens to hundreds of feet from the source. Some blocks closest to the explosion site were three feet, one meter wide, and weighed hundreds, if not thousands of pounds. The explosion was largely directed to the northeast towards the Firehole River, and the largest blocks of debris fell in that direction where there were no people, amazingly. The dark color of the explosion that many people on the interwebs fear-mongered about as being volcanic was a result of mud and debris mixed with steam and boiling water, nothing more. Although visitors were present at the time of the event, not a single injury was reported in this miraculous explosion. Thank you, God. Kilauea information statement today, the Upper East Rift Zone, the intrusion continues and is ongoing. Here we can see yet another magma intrusion triggering intense seismic swarm and ground inflation under the East Rift Zone. This is ongoing as we speak. Buckle up, buttercup. Also, coming in yesterday, Bezimiani with a major explosion to 40,000 feet. Peaking, I believe, 43,000 feet. We'll get to that in just a moment. Swanos Hema today exploding. And here is the Bezamiani report, 40, 43,000 foot. That is the largest eruption we've had in months. And a good news to report on that. Haven't heard any uh, reports on any casualties or ill effects. Fuego to 15,000 feet. Sabankai to 22,000. Liwa Tobi, 10,000 foot puff today. Here is Bezamiani, the eruption plume drifts hundreds of kilometers following strong pyroclastic flow yesterday. This is in the Kamchatka, very remote region. Sangay to 19,000 foot, Ibu to 7,000. Semaru, who knew? Now you do, 15,000 foot puff today. We've got Bezamiani puffing again, 28,000 foot earlier today. Nevado de Ruiz to 20,000 foot, Ibu to 7. Bezamiani, 16,000 foot puff. As the activity comes to a close, Sabankaya, 22,000. Liwa to 10,000. White Island, a brief eruption today with some volcanic gas and ash. Sun Gay to 19,000 foot. And Bezamiani, explosive activity continuing recently with... Volcanic ash plume rising to 16,000 feet, wrapping up 
a cacophony of explosions from Bezamiani on the Camp Chakta. Well, some claim we're still at solar max, but we're clearly dipping back down into solar minimum. Sunspots are just pricks on the desk and doing very little except impulsive flaring. We do have some small impulsive coronal mass ejections headed our way, including a plasma filament, which was uh, barely uh, a geomagnetic storm maker. But we did get a glancing blow of a rogue CME that no one was expecting. Now, the last plasma filament had two pieces I told you about. I think the second piece was bigger than the first piece. And the first piece hit was nothing. The second piece has hit today. And that sent us up into the moderate 400s. We're now approaching 500 kilometers per second in plasma speed. Uh, with a major shift in the BZ. Not the phi angle staying pretty steady. That's pushed us up above KP3. Nothing spectacular. Low-level aurora possibilities emanating tonight. Maybe it'll kick up a notch. It's anyone's guess. But we are waiting. And there is that telemetry. Boom, up once. And another kick up just moments ago. So we could be seeing some aurora with this secondary kick up happening right now. Now we've taken you over here to Lasco C3 to show you the last 36 hours of the sun. And you can see that halo eruption coming our way. That just occurred earlier today. Um, boom, right there. Very clearly. Twice, I'm going to say twice as strong as the last halo eruption we just had the other day, which amounted to almost nothing except what we just saw there. That rogue CME is part of that vague halo CME. This one much more pronounced and headed our way for the 27th and the 28th. We've got several space weather events that are coming together that could be bringing us some significant boom. So far, the detailed forecast just showing G1 geomagnetic storm. I would say we may get to G2 somewhere in July 27th and 28th. Mark my words, I typically don't go out on a limb here and say that the forecast is wrong, but they're wrong. Just as wrong as, I won't even mention his name, the suspicious one. All right, let's take a look at the WSA Endless Spiral, the latest update, and it's going to be showing you a couple of those CMEs. Uh, one major one that came off the limb of the sun, sun there. You can see that darkened black plasma heading directly down and away from Earth. Um, and so nothing really coming together to hit Earth, yet they have a spike here. I don't understand what's going on there. And then that is the CME from earlier today that apparently has been now modeled. So everything, boom, is coming together. Yeah, just elevated everything from the 27th on. So we should be up in KP3 to 4 for an extended period of time. Maybe kick up a little higher than that. Um, or perhaps their models are wrong. Big news. Mercury has a layer of diamond up to 10 miles thick, according to scientists. Scientists from China and Belgium think two processes could have resulted in the thick diamond crust on Mercury. And if it's true, <laughs> I'm moving to Mercury. Are you kidding me? It might be the smallest planet in the solar system now that they kicked uh, Pluto to the curb. But Mercury could be hiding a big secret. Diamond. A layer of diamond beneath the crust of Mercury could be up to 10 miles thick, according to new research. This has everything to do with carbon being prevalent everywhere on terrestrial planets and the fact that, well, the representation of that carbon, whether it be soot, graphite, or diamond, all has to do with the temperature and pressure. Scientists from China and Belgium used data collected by NASA's MESSENGER spacecraft between 2004 and 15 to inform their theories about the structure of the planet's interior. The researchers think two processes could have resulted in the 10-mile-thick diamond layer. First, the crystallization of the magma ocean, but this process likely contributed to forming only a very thin diamond layer at the core mantle interface according to Oliver Nemour, a member of the research team and associate professor at KU Leuven. He told Space.com that. Good news. He didn't tell me anything. Secondly, and most importantly, the crystallization of the metal core of mercury. 
<laughs> How the fuck do we know what that is? Anyway, I do digress. When the planet was formed 4.5 billion years ago, we've gone into fairy tale land now, the metal core was entirely liquid based on no information whatsoever, which progressively crystallized over time, according to Mr. Namor, who must be smoking crack. Sharticle. Sharks test positive for cocaine in Brazil's drug-polluted waters. No wonder so many people are being gobbled up by the great whites these days. And I've unticked surfing from my bucket list. I've already jumped out of an airplane, after all, and snowboarded, so why would I need to surf? There's all those little sharks eating people. But the cocaine does worry me. Can you imagine all the tourists coming back from vacation in Brazil with a habit? I'll tell you how to kick the habit or to survive and thrive in the future with real drugs. Yeah, the ones that doctors prescribe to you that you may need, like pharmaceuticals, like antibiotics, insulin, maybe things to regulate your heart. Come over to one of our affiliates, the Jace case, where you can get your own emergency medication for your family to survive and thrive in the coming times. Let's say there's a major storm, a hurricane, a tornado. Power's out for days. You can't get to the doctor. You remember you've got a year's supply of your medication in the closet in the dark in the Jace case. You can add additional things that maybe your doctor won't prescribe, like, yeah, ivermectin and many others, including extra inhalers like albuterol and any antibiotic you can think of. We can throw it in there. Lyme disease, urinary tract inf infection, pneumonia, even bacterial vaginosis, which sounds absolutely horrific. Get the Jay's case. Peace of mind to survive and thrive in case of an emergency. We love you, and that's a boom to knowledge. Please share the video. We're shadow ban. We need your help to grow. Become a Patreon. Support the work we do. We're hemorrhaging, hemorrhaging Patreons, but it's, well, we know. It's because everyone's poor in Joe Biden's world. We still love you, but we need all of you that can to reach out and support the channel as we are hemorrhaging as well. We love each and every one of you, and we'll see you all at the Crestone Energy Fair coming up in the middle of September where Lee and I will have an amazing interactive booth on seed saving. And that's a boom to knowledge. Mm -hmm.